Our second lesson today comes from Paul's letter to the church in Rome, chapter 13, verses 8 through 14, which can be found on page 162 in your pew Bible if you would like to follow along. Let us together listen for the voice of God. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from your sleep. For salvation is nearer now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of the darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We create pictures of love every day. It is a vital part of what makes us human, of what it means to be alive. We hear it in our poetry. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Sonnet 43 by Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Or William Shakespeare, Sonnet 18. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? We behold it in our sculpture. The Kiss by Rodin, The Pieta by Michelangelo. We see it in our movies, The Big Sick, or in our house, Notting Hill for the hundredth time, (laughs) or any movie, really, starring Hugh Grant, Julia Roberts, Sandra Bullock, or Drew Barrymore. (laughs) We tell it in our stories, Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen, The Notebook, by Nicholas Sparks. We hear it in our music, All You Need Is Love, by The Beatles. Love Story, by Taylor Swift. And no list about love songs would be complete without Love Hurts, Love Stinks, and You Give Love a Bad Name. (laughs) Indeed, we create pictures of love every day, and our children are paying attention to the stories we tell and the images we create. When a group of four- to eight-year-olds were asked, what does love mean, this is what they said. Carl, who is five years old, said, love is when a girl puts on perfume and a guy puts on cologne and they go out and smell each other. (laughs) Chrissy said, Love is when you go out to eat and you give someone most of your french fries without making them give you any of theirs. (laughs) Rebecca, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time. Even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love. Billy, when someone loves you, the way they say your name is different. You know that your name is safe in their mouth. And Bobby, love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening presents and just listen. And Niles Crane, the son of a friend of mine, said, Love can't unstick. It's too sticky. In our text this morning from his letter to the church in Rome, the Apostle Paul also creates a picture of love in words. 
It's perhaps his most radical statement about what it means to be a follower of Christ. It is definitely one of his most direct and concise. Here in our text, Paul pushes the reader to to go deeper than the human tendency to strive for to fill religious obligations so as to gain divine favor somehow. Here he presents a different way of thinking, a different way of being in the world. Paul presents his readers with the way forward as a people into a world that is transformed. Oh, no one anything, he writes, except to love one another. For the one who loves has fulfilled the law, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Although it isn't a direct quote from Jesus, it's relatively close. As close as Paul gets. The sentiment is definitely the same. And Paul and Jesus reference the same command from the book of Leviticus. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now in a first century world that was full of obligations to your benefactor, to the emperor, to God, it was countercultural, completely radical to say that there was only one thing anyone really owes and that one thing is love. Paul invites his reader to awaken to the way of love. Of our passage, the Reverend Dr. Rochelle Stackhouse writes, the text lays out clearly the simplicity and complexity of our daily journey. Simply, love is the essence of discipleship the basis of transformation. That love, however, involves all we are and do individually and as faith communities every day. Friends, this is a wonderful time at Northminster. I don't know if you know this, but the choir's back. We are rooted in a beautiful past full of incredible challenges and stories that have shaped us. You heard some of those stories last week in Karen's beautiful sermon. And we are propelled forward by an undying sense of purpose. And now we find ourselves here at the beginning of a magnificent new chapter of ministry together. And it is full of so much energy, excitement, joy, and opportunity. It is palpable. And as we live into our future full of promise, as we begin a new program year together, let us consider what it might mean to commit ourselves again to the obligation of which Paul writes. What if our North Star, our guiding principle, was to owe no one anything except to love one another? Love. Love is what we owe ourselves. Love is what we owe to one another. Love has the power to shape us. This kind of love will transform our church, our neighborhood, our community, and our world. And you know that. For after all, we have said that it is our goal to engage with neighbors near and far in Christ's love. So let us courageously investigate what it might mean for us as a congregation to live into love. But let us do so with the understanding that this love is not a wishy-washy, feel-good, saccharine, sweet, chronic niceness. No. No, this love is fierce. This love is strong. This love is an intractable force that changes everything. And of this kind of love, pastor and author Frederick Buechner writes, in the Christian sense, love is not primarily an emotion, but an act of the will. When Jesus tells us and Paul reminds us to love our neighbors, they're not 
telling us to love them in the sense of responding to them with cozy emotional feeling. On the contrary, they are telling us to love our neighbors in the sense of being willing to work for their well-being, even if it means sacrificing our own well-being to that end. Committing ourselves to this kind of love has the power to make us revolutionaries. Through this love, we become people who are willing to imagine and to create new ways of living in the world, individually and together, that lead to equity, equality, inclusion, and justice for all people. It creates new worlds, this love. It has the courage to go against convention and the way, way it has always been, so that everyone has the opportunity to thrive. Lives shaped by this love find opportunities to invest time, energy, and finances in ways and in places that match these commitments. Love is revolutionary. As a people of faith living into this dynamic potential of love has risk involved, can make us risk takers. Love allows us the freedom and the creativity to cross the false boundaries designed to separate us from each other. This love conquers our fears and our aversion to risk that keep us bound to old ways of thinking and destructive isolationism. A faith characterized by love is one that looks at the other in the eye and sees the divine looking back. It willingly connects with and seeks to learn from those who think, pray, worship, and practice faith in ways that are different from our own, and then calls what we discover there the realm of God. Yes, love is risky. A corporate Life committed to and characterized by love is resilient. It is one that does not give up. Even when faced with seemingly insurmountable obstacles and threatening challenges, it understands that there is too much at stake to abdicate our obligation in spite of the forces that push against it and mistakes that we will invariably make along the way. Love is more than just a nice way of existing in the world. Love is everything. And we can and will do hard things because of this love. Bell Hooks wrote, Love is as love does. Love is an act of will, namely both an intention and an action. Love is resilient. Love is our obligation revolutionary, risky, and resilient love is what we owe. It fulfills all law. Near the end of her exquisite book, Fierce Love, the Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis writes, My friends and yours, all of those who are a part of this love movement, are drops that adhere to one another. They join together and move like a river, like a waterfall. These drops become a mighty stream of love and justice, powerful enough to wear away the jagged stone of broken systems. They are persistent enough to transform the parched places where injustice chokes life out of the vulnerable into an oasis of peace. Yes, this love, this revolutionary risky, and resilient love is a mighty river. It's a roaring sea. And we are summoned into its rapids. Called into the tide. 
So at the beginning of another program year at Northminster, let's begin right here. Let's commit ourselves to not just dip our toes into the water. Let's get all the way in together. Let's shoot the rapids and surf the tide of love. A revolutionary, risky, and resilient love like this creates the world for which we have been waiting. Friends, let's love like everything depends on it. Because it does. It really does. If you were going to create a picture of this love, what would it look like? Can you see it? Will you share it with one another? With the world? Not for our own sake, but to God be the glory. Amen.